My name is Mary Chabber, mother of three children, one of six children who came here in the 50s, 60s of migrant um, workers from the Caribbean. I attended a primary school, secondary school, um, and then I went on to further um, education college. Um, I actually attended Moston College of Education um, in the 60s where I underwent um, a level course in order to get into the BSc in nursing. Unfortunately, I didn't get the grades um, to do that course um, at Manchester University. So, but I was able to then choose the lower um, part of the course, which was to be trained as a state registered nurse. And in those days, if you did the degree in nursing, it carried more um, hype, yeah, um, than say um, the SRN course. But the SRN course actually was still far better than the Enroll Nurses course, which quite a lot of the, um, unfortunately, a lot of the Caribbean nurses who came here in the 60s, they were advised to do the Enroll Nurses course, but it really didn't take them very far in relation to the career. Um, I started um, straight from college at the age of 18, yeah. And out of, say, a cohort of about 20 of us. Um, there were only about three blacks. Um, and at the end of the first year, I was the only one remaining on that course. Of course, it was very um, stressful because, you know, we had to live in, in, in the, um, the halls of residence or the nurses' home then. And for those who came from the Caribbean, it was even more stressful for them because it was a new island, new environment, new food, um, which they found quite difficult. And it also includes the Irish nurses, actually, because they came over as well for training. Um, I was probably a bit more fortunate in that I had my parents here um, in the Moss Side area. Um, so I was able to return home at weekends, you know, or uh, whenever, you know, I, I had time to return. So that made it a bit more easier for me um, to relax, whereas they would actually have to stay in, in, in the home, you know, all the time. Um, many of them found it very, very stressful, very, very stressful, and they just wanted to return home, yeah. I could return home, but my home was in Moss Side. I trained in North Manchester, which is not that far, really, yeah. Um, I mean, Moss Side was a community then, you know, everybody knew everyone. Uh, my parents, they had a house on Princess Road. And then, of course, the council came and compulsory purchased the houses, so we lost that community feeling as well. Um, then, after I qualified as a nurse, I then um, practiced for a while as a nurse, as a staff nurse, and then went on to do my midwifery at Withington Hospital, uh, within Shaw, because during that time there was part one and part two. Um, and then I practiced after I qualified at Withington for quite a few years. I was mainly on the labour ward and worked quite a bit in theatre because I like to know where the action is. And that was sort of delivering babies in an emergency. Um, it, it wasn't a nice thing, but I found it quite rewarding. Yes, yeah, and it was very skillful. Um, in that you had to know the instruments that you had to hand to the surgeon. And because it was an emergency, you know, time was of the essence, yes. Once I qualified as a midwife, I, I was a staff nurse for about two years, and then two years as, an, as a sister on, as a, um, on the midwifery ward. But the, I was a very unsociable, you know. Um, my husband and I was working, we like, ships in the night, we didn't see each other because when I was at work, I couldn't say to a lady who was sort of ready to have the baby, I'm sorry dear, but you just got to stop pushing because I need to be off duty. You can't tell them that, can you? So many times I would get home around about 10 o'clock, 11, and I thought, no, this is not very good for family life. So then I decided that I was going to try and um, try something else further. I thought of social work, but then I was advised against it 
because at the time it wasn't that lucrative. It was very stressful because poverty was much more rife then. Um, my husband was due to move to Bradford because he was working for the, the co-op bank at the time. Um, but later he changed his mind. But I had already been accepted to do the course at Bradford Poly. And so I decided that the best thing to do is to continue with the course in Bradford, continue commuting from Manchester to Bradford. But in the end, I had to live in halls because it was just too stressful to continue with that. But fortunately, I was able to, you know, um, complete the course and pass. Um, and then I started practicing as a health visitor, yeah. Other challenges I would say in the working environment was to do with the patients, because when they saw you, they started thinking, am I proficient? Am I able to nurse them to the full, you know? Um, just to explain, yeah. tell, us, tell us why, why you think that is. Yeah, and, and there was also, because I, I noticed as well, because I'm fairer compared to some of the other colleagues who were much darker than I am, you know, there was definitely a little bit of resentment, you know, whereas I would say in some situation I fitted in better because of my colour, which, which is quite, quite sad really, you know what I mean. But it's nothing new really worldwide because even in the Caribbean, you know, there is that colour prejudice even amongst our own, you know, colour. Um, but I didn't allow that to really get to me. I just thought to myself, I'm here to do a job. I do it to the best of my ability and just basically get on with it, you know. Um, sometimes, you know, when it came to, like, say, carrying out the dirty work, then it was like the black nurses who tended to do more of it than the indigenous, yeah. Um, some of the nurses were very sensitive to that and they would just basically vocalise how they were feeling, yeah. Uh, I tend to be a little bit more modest, a little bit more diplomatic, you know, when it comes to certain issues to do with race, unlike my husband who will tell it as it is. In the 50s, 60s, they were asking for people to come and train as nurses, you know, to fill the gap, yeah. And as far as they were concerned, they were here to fill that gap. They were here to fill a purpose, irrespective of the colour of their skin. And sometimes it made them very, very angry, because like, they were treated like um, second-class citizens. You know, and they had a lot to contend with because, you know, they had to adapt to the, the diet. You know, they weren't accustomed to the English way of, uh, of um, eating. And a, a lot of the habits they had to adapt. And in a way, they had to be actors, you know, to sort of switch from one situation to the other, to keep sane, you know what I mean? And, and that was quite hard. And when it came to um, your exam, you were sort of, um, how can I, the assessment was deeper, you know, simple things that the indigenous nurses would get away with, we didn't, you know, so we had to work that extra hard, you know, we had to cross our T's and dots our I's, you know, um, in order to progress and sometimes you just had to keep quiet, you know, just to, to move ahead. I remember when I was doing the health visiting course in Bradford, there was only two of us on the course. There was one black girl and myself. She was from Trinidad, but she was very vocal. And as a result of that, she actually didn't, didn't complete the course because they thought that she was too aggressive. She needed to calm down. And that, um, that was a mark against her because what they were saying, well, if you go into the homes, you know, because we are visitors in the homes, you know, we have no right there, no legal right in the home. The, the legal part of it is that the borough or the authority has to provide the service, but the, the clients, as we call them then, they don't have to accept the service, you know. And unfortunately, she wasn't able to complete the course in Bradford, but she went elsewhere and was able to complete it then. So there was lots of challenges to, to, to face, really. But we, without the Caribbean nurses, there would have been no, no NHS, definitely. Well, I first met um, Louise <coughs> when I went to, for an interview um, in Staley Bridge. And I believe she was like the only black 
help the sitter at the time in, in, in Tameside. And when she saw me in the corridor waiting to go in for the interview, she says, good for you, well done, yeah. Fortunately, I did get the post, yeah. And I worked for many years in, in Tameside. Um, Louise was a manager then, but I know she had quite a lot of challenges, you know. Um, and then she eventually moved on into the um, managerial side and went back into the hospital to be a manager. Yeah. Um, but my close inv further involvement was more to do with my husband's involvement, you know, with um, what was going on in Moss Side at the time. Yeah. Um, but we developed a special bond and, you know, we continued up until, well, post death, really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, after sort of um, qualifying and practicing as a health visitor for many years, I was actually encouraged to do the community practice teachers course where I would, once I got the appropriate qualifications, be able to have students who were in practice, you know, and sort of show them the ropes and then I would actually have to assess them as to whether they're fit to practice or not. And that came with many challenges because sometimes they wouldn't agree with your decision. But the thing is, is, is that um, it was paramount to know that they are safe to practice, yeah. I mean, the course that I did was at Manchester um, Metropolitan. Um, I, I noticed recently that they've actually knocked the building down. It used to be the Elizabeth Gaskell College. And I did a year there for the um, community practice teachers um, um, course, yeah. It was quite intense, you know, but interesting. And it uh, allowed me that opportunity to be able to take students, you know, in the community, assess them, and then approve that they were competent and confident, you know, to carry out the practice, yeah. The black students that I had were more challenging. <laughs> they really were more challenging because they expected me to say, yes, you've passed when they haven't achieved the, the, the standard, the required stan standard. And one just cannot do that, you know. So I came across quite, came quite, came across quite a lot of challenges when it came to um, some, of, some of our students, yeah. And um, all the students that came in, I mean, you must have had a diverse range. Yeah, I did, yes, yeah. I mean, some were very sort of appreciative of my support um, that was given. Because sometimes they would sort of bring their um, written work and I would say I'm sorry but really you have to do a bit more research you know and you have to back it up and they would sort of look at me and think what's going on here and but they would go away take on my advice and then they would you know say oh thanks for that advice the um the head of year said it was very well done so yeah it was good mm. I was the secretary for the carnival for um quite a few years uh, but I think I got burnt out and um a bit cheesed off, to be honest. So I thought, no, no, it's time to relinquish my involvement. Not my complete involvement, but that post as secretary, you know, I, I sort of relinquished that post. And, and then I became more um, interactive, you know, with the various carnival groups rather than being there, taking minutes and writing for funds and stuff like that, yeah. I think all the stalwarts in the community were very supportive and that the carnival should continue, you know, because it is part of our heritage. And, and what's so surprising in that we were there before the Mellors and now the Mellors have taken over. The and, Yeah, they've taken over and taken off, you know. And um, the Caribbean carnival now is second class, you know. But I'm hopeful that maybe it will continue to become a bit stronger now. The legacy of the stalwarts, I think, has been tremendous. I think not for the women in the community um, taking up the mantle, I don't think we would be where we are, um, because there have been a lot of challenges, as, as you probably know. Um, in the 60s, they destroyed the community by knocking down the houses. They built the horrible flats, which created more vermin, more crime and stuff like that. And if we had sat down and not said anything, then, you know, um, we wouldn't be where we are today. 
Yeah. So I think they've had a great role, really, in moving the agenda forward. Yes. And, you know, we Africans, particularly the women, you know, we're strong regardless of what we're going to carry on. Yeah. Um, and we bring the men with us as well. Yeah. Um, but it's, 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 it's the nature of the beast, really. You know, without us, you know, the, the human race would not survive. Yeah. In times of war, it's the women in the background, you know, who are doing quite a lot of the, the donkey work to ensure that, you know, we win the war or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's very positive that um, they've done a lot for the community. And one hopes that, you know, the, the, the current generation will, will carry on with that mantle. But um, sometimes I have my doubts because we've got a different agenda now. We really have a different agenda, which is sad, you know, um, with computerization, with the WhatsApp and stuff like that. The kids are so easily influenced, you know. But I think if they have a, a strong family connection, and it doesn't have to be um, mother and father, you know, it can be, you know, either or with both. Um, and discipline, of course, is important and respect, you know, for people and the elders which seems to be on the decline at the moment, unfortunately, yeah.